All right, our parents, here we are in April. Um, this is our second to the last lesson for the year, which is nuts, right? And I'm so sorry for the delay. I have just run into a few problems and it's awesome. We will have the art cart set up today and we'll have all of the prints ready, hopefully within the next day or two. Um, we're just, I'm just having some issues, but you just gotta roll with it, right? Um, so onto the fun stuff. We have probably um, the most colorful, one of the most fun artists in art history, and also arguably the most technically skilled artist of the modern art era. Um, this is Salvador Dali, and I put his full name in the notes for you guys. I'm not even gonna go there. <laughs> it's so long, um, which is a typical Spanish thing, I guess. Um, he was named after his father, Salvador, but also his older brother, who died when he was nine months, um, or died nine months before he was born. And as I mentioned in the notes, kind of a crazy story, but really, I think, illustrative and kind of indicative of, I don't know, the craziness to come. Um, he, When he was five years old, his parents took him to his brother's grave, sat him down and said, hey, you're the reincarnation of your older brother. And he really um, held to that. He included his brother in a lot of his artwork later on. And he was just a really interesting guy. I don't know what it is about Spanish artists or maybe just Spanish people in general because it seems like a lot of the traditions um, associated with Spanish Catholicism are a lot more um, like graphic and physical and um, I don't know I just lots of lots of interesting big personalities for the Spanish artists going clear back like to Renaissance times with Velasquez um, up Pablo Picasso and even modern times we've got Mikel Barcello that we studied um, a year or maybe even two years ago. And he's a really colorful guy. I'm definitely more like sane, traditionally <laughs> speaking, but his art is very colorful. Um, so Dolly, very colorful guy. And a guy who um, was super self-promoting. So he really became part of, um, part of pop culture and kind of an everyday household thing. He did ads, he did store windows, he helped with movies. Um, Hitchcock, um, Alfred Hitchcock was fascinated by him and the way he saw shadows and kind of dreamscapes and used him, um, asked him to produce one of his movies and used his work in a lot of one of his movies. Um, at that time when they were in New York during World War II and then clear, and they stayed for quite a while after, and then were back and forth after, he really, I mean, he really did not hesitate to insert himself into anywhere he could in culture, which is awesome. I mean, that's great. There are a lot of jokes about him. When you see um, movies that, that include popular characters from the past, he is often portrayed very like, Dali, you know me, right, Dali? <laughs> so fun artists, there's tons of footage on YouTube. If you're interested in him, you can definitely go check him out. And he did um, kind of hit the height of his work in the 60s. So keep in mind, um, there's definitely plenty of that, like 60s weirdness stuff. So not always, don't just necessarily pull anything up for your kids, <laughs> is what I'm trying to say here. So moving on, um, one of the fun things about Salvador Dali was that he used a ton of symbolism in his work. And I've included a list of the symbols and the meanings he ascribed to him because not only did he use symbolism, but unlike many, many other artists, he, um, he told you exactly what he what those symbols were meant to be. He was very explicit about it. He didn't want to leave it up to interpretation interpretation like so many artists do. So Rhino's big theme, and here is a major bronze that he that he did. And I mean, look at the detail and the skill and you know, in the concept as well as the execution, but his paintings are kind of the same way. I mean, they're so interesting because they're so. Um, well rendered. He is, his, um, his art is just amazing. And yet it has this super surreal dreamlike quality to it. And the surrealists were a movement that had um, strong ideals. They had like written, I, they, there was a lot of, 
he wrote he wrote a few books and then there were a lot of books and manifestos and that sort of thing and remember this is during the war years too so he survived world war one and world war two and um and actually was um ousted like like formally ousted the surrealists had a trial and ousted him from their group i don't want to say like excommunicated is the word that comes to mind but i don't think that's that really applies here um, but anyway he was I, they really disliked him because because he didn't take an anti-fascist stand during the war he actually worked pretty well with the spanish government during that time i think he was a definitely a self-promoting guy but an interesting guy really interesting it's been fascinating to study him over the last few weeks and um, so here you can see so his paintings are characterized by these i mean just beautiful details very realistic, almost photorealistic, um, but then dreamlike and a little bit off. It makes you, there are things in there that just kind of throw you askew, makes you feel like something's off. And the whole point was to make you think about life, think about the things that they wanted you to think about, the surrealists, the, the political issues at the time, but also just to, you know, just to think about life, to look around you and see things a little bit differently. Dali also loved um, illusion pictures. So pictures that you see one thing immediately, and then um, and then as you look more closely, you start to see different images in there. And I have one that I want. Um, oh, let's see. I want. I'm trying to get this one for you guys for for the art cart. But this is one of my favorite examples. So you see the old couple immediately, but then as you look more closely, you can see the guy playing the guitar for the woman and they're sitting in the archway. And it's a really detailed scene that works in both directions. You've got the curtains over here for her hair. Um, it's really, I'm really amazing. He has a lot of really great illusion paintings like that. And um, and did ever, um, as a at a young age, he was um, really working with forced perspective and um, foreshadowing um, shadows and elongating shadows to show different perspectives and really just an amazing technical skill. He was trained as a draftsman, so I mean, you can see where that like minute detail, that eye for detail really comes in. Um, his parents were super supportive. There's one for you. He was a middle class, um, kind of his dad was a middle class lawyer. His, um, his dad was pretty stern and um, definitely authoritarian, but his mom was really sweet and he really, really loved his mom. Um, he said that when, when she died, when he was in like his 20s or 30s, he was older but not old, um, it, was the, it was the hardest thing he, he would ever go through in his life is what he said about it. He really loved his mom. They were very supportive. His dad saw his, um, his talent and started holding um, salons for his drawings when he was 12. So his dad would exhibit his drawings and sell them. And maybe that's where the self-promotion starts now that I think about it. Um, he was kind of raised that way, right? He was also turbulent. He was thrown out of art school at university. Um, he protested, led this great revolt against another artist of the day. And, um, and I, you know, I didn't really find a ton of detail about it, but ended up being expelled from school. And he would, um, he would have these major, I need just shenanigans to promote his work and his books. He did a book signing where he hooked himself up to an EKG and, um, what is it where they put the things on your, the, um, the dials on your head and and he so he laid in a hospital bed had people line up and he signed books for him and then he'd rip off the tape for the part where he was talking to them and give him his ekg give them his ekg with the book I and mean, that was just crazy funny stuff he um he was a really interesting guy more pictures coming but you can see just this mixture of the everyday the mixture of reality in with something absurd that makes you really just take a step back and look. So we're gonna create our own pictures that have a surrealist feel. 
Um, we've got the watercolor paper to use for this, that nice paper that will absorb the water well. Um, you can't get it like super, super wet, so you know, still be careful there. But a few tips for painting with watercolors, we always want our brushes at least a little bit wet. Even if you, um, if you're painting, if the kids are painting and they notice that it's starting to get a little bit streaky, you don't have to rinse out and start again. You can just dip your, dip your brush quickly in the water and just tap it on the edge to get off, you know, so it's not like pooling on the paper and then go back to work. Um, watercolor is fun because you can mix it and it bleeds and sometimes that can be frustrating for the kids, but I just make sure to always tell them that the, um, the bleed is part of what makes watercolors so beautiful. So embrace the bleed, use that to, you know, to add interest and colors and shadows. Um, don't stress out about it. Watercolor isn't great to do upright though because it's so flowy. So I'll give you a quick, I've drawn two pictures that we can use um, for, the, um, for the examples. This one I'll finish up or maybe not, maybe just leave them. And then I thought I'd just leave this one um, out on the table that you guys can add, add stuff to as you're discussing and um, showing them the techniques. There'll also be a stack of um, just regular printer paper, which is great to just practice on. So say, you know, tell them it's okay to take, um, take a minute and think about what you want to make because really that is where the tricky part of a surrealist painting comes in. You've got to take the time to think about what you want to do and what you want to stay, say and maybe throw in some symbolism there. If you feel like an orange represents the segments of your life or, you know, whatever, um, throw that in. Make that part of the painting and, and then give it a dreamlike quality. Make things unusual. So here I have my, um, my little scene here where they're swimming in an umbrella. I've got my sun dripping off the clouds and turning into flower petals. Um, I don't know. That's just where I went with it. And if you um, if you want to keep your colors kind of light and mild, you'll just want to add water and see how I put down my original like few stripes of color, but I just picked up a little bit more water and added it to what I had. I didn't get more paint on my brush. I'm just adding a little bit more water. And what that does is gives me a nice um, kind of mellow wash. And so see how I can kind of move, I can kind of manipulate and move the, um, the paint around on the paper. Sorry, this is really hard to do holding up. Um, so I'm coming back in. I haven't added any more paint to my, to my paper yet, to my paintbrush. I'm just coming in with water to help it flow around. And oops, I got some on my clouds and I didn't really want it there. So what I could do is just take a napkin I'm using my finger because I don't have a napkin on me right this second. But I can take a napkin and just lightly dot it to those areas and it will absorb the water and pick up that color. So watercolor, it's a pretty forgiving medium. It's a pretty fun medium to use and to work with. And I could even come back in and like I say, take advantage of that bleed. And while this blue is still kind of wet, maybe I'll just add in a little bit of purple to shade and make it interesting and see how it's bleeding down into the blue, kind of making it interesting. Now I don't, I'm starting to scrub back and forth on my paper just a little bit too much and you see how my paper's balling up. That is not a good thing. We don't want that in our paintings. So I'm gonna be careful to not, um, to not ball up or to not scrub back and forth too much more in that area. I'm gonna kind of leave it alone. Let's see how, you know, my sky's a little bit more interesting because I added in some of that, um, some of that purple. So as you can see, easy, easy, easy project. Um, really fun one though, fun to think about. Just think about how you can manipulate um, the images that we see in everyday life to make it more interesting, to make it more dreamlike. Um, if you have any questions or need anything, please don't hesitate to contact me and I hope you enjoy Salvador Dali.